next I'd like to welcome Chris Ward to the stage from AECOM. He's gonna be introducing our next speaker. Come on, welcome Chris. Uh, thank you very much. Wow, what a crowd, 800 people. Lucky for um, Seattle. This is my um, third time uh, privilege of introducing Jeanette. I think the first time I praised her, um, the second time I definitely teased her, so this time I will be serious. Um, and I'm not talking about what's happening tonight. But I've had three sort of tough data points this past week in New York City. The first one was I was at the UN Habitat um, Conference. And 25 years ago, the first Habitat Conference basically held that in order to maintain worldwide prosperity, um, the rural population should essentially be stabilized where it is. Today, we now know that 45% of the world's population will move into a city in the next 45 years. Um, an incredible statistic. Um, then 70% of those cities are coastal cities, all cities facing the incredible challenge of uh, climate change. And I was reading this really wonderful book by this French climatologist historian who was writing in 1971. And at the end of the book, he's writing very optimistically that um, the next 10,000 years, if you look at the sort of history of the globe, that the, the globe would be looking at a very positive, probably tempered climate, which would be good for the agriculture and good for the habitat. But he ends with like one thing, except however that there's growing concerns with CO2 emissions and if we can't begin to understand how that's gonna play out, but we'll remain optimistic. And that book was written in 1971. Um, and then last, uh, the question of growth and the question of how will this globe prosper and will there be enough wealth to maintain the population that we've created? And there really are some very, very chilling growth forecast that if you look at our generation, if you look at even the generation before us, um, you will likely not see the level of investment and invention and creativity when you think of things as simple as a combine, as a telephone, as penicillin. The amount of things that were invented in our lifetime that created an incredible, incredible amount of forward growth. Um, will there be that level of invention and creativity going forward? Um, and all of those sort of came together in this past week, and I was thinking about this group and the support group that you are and the warriors that you all are um, and fighting for that battle of a livable city, but increasingly so a prosperous city, a city that can take care of the people who need and, and want to live there. And I think more and more that that is a growing, growing challenge that each city must demonstrate its capacity to be both livable and be prosperous. And I think one of the people who's probably leading that fight stronger than anybody else here in the United States is Jeanette Sadekan. Wow, that was kind of depressing. <laughs> Um, I think I'm going to do a reverse introduction, and I'm going to introduce Chris Ward. So, and Chris's life actually reads kind of like one of those epic adventure tales. Um, how many people do you know started out working on an oil rig, then went to divinity school, then ran three city agencies, a stevedore company, and then had the wisdom to become the executive director of the Port Authority for New York and New Jersey? Um, otherwise known as the Empire. <laughs> and he actually drove construction forward on that World Trade Center site at a time when everybody had basically given up hope that anything could be done on that site. It was complete paralysis. Chris is a true Jedi and a philosopher king, and he is now at AECOM, and he is a terrific supporter of NACTO, and he is a great friend. So I want all of us to give a big round of applause for Chris Ward. <laughs> And for all those introductions, right? All those introductions. Um, welcome to the revolution. Woo! We are here. And I don't think it's a support group. I think it is a revolution. And to start, I really want to thank the people at NACTO that have done such an amazing job. Corinne Kisner, Linda Bailey, the rest of the NACTO team. Raise your hands from NACTO. Stand up. Stand up. Huge round of applause. Sky Duncan, the DDCI team. 
It's amazing, and it is a movement. So welcome to the fifth annual Designing Cities Conference. Everyone in this room is part of a sea change in transportation. And cities, as you know, are leading the way to reimagine their streets, what they are, and who they're for making transformations at the local level, which is driving change nationally and globally. And, you know, I know how you feel sometimes. You know, you're in the thick of these projects that you're working on. It could be a bike lane, a plaza, a bus lane, and it feels like it is just endless, you know? You are not making progress, and it is so tough to go up against the forces of the status quo. But I want to take a moment to remember just how far we've come in the last five years. How many of you were there for the first Designing Cities Conference in 2012? Pretty good, right? An amazing conference in New York. We had 400 people from some 30 cities and we had 23 members. Today, we have over 700 people here from 125 cities and NACTO has grown to 52 members and transit agencies. And this momentum translates into real change on our city streets. But there are still too many scenes like this. Auto-centric policies that have actually divided our cities and divided our communities and left, us, left people unable to access new opportunities. We have come an awfully long way but we have a long road ahead of us. This is Pioneer Square. Scott would uh, recognize this. Uh, this is in Seattle about 100 years ago. And this is the same location today. Our streets have morphed into highways. But we started to see a fundamental rethinking of our streets over the last five years as we confront the challenges of population growth and climate change and economic e inequality and traffic fatalities. And the discussion around mobility isn't just an abstraction. It is directly tied to the economic prospects of the world. And these challenges require us to be bold and creative with our streets. Einstein famously said, we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. That means we're not going to solve our mobility problems by building more and more roads and highways. We need to redesign our streets so that they are safe for walking, they are safe for transit, they are safe for biking and driving. Moving away from auto-centric designs like these to transit-friendly designs like these. And in the last five years, since our first conference, we've seen a huge surge in safe bike infrastructure across the country and a dramatic increase in the number of people that are actually riding. In some cities, they see a four-fold, five-fold, six-fold increase in riding. And creating this new road order is not easy, as most of you know. Uh, there are battles, and there is backlash. I want to ask, does anybody know what this road is? Clarence? <laughs> Prospect Park West. Yes, it is. This, yes, that's Norman in the background hiding in his car. Um, this road was once called this new lane, the most contested slab of concrete outside the Gaza Strip. And five and a half years ago, I was sued for actually making this street safer than it was before instead of sticking to its dangerous status quo state. So I was sued. Um, lots of depositions, lots of uh, agita, lots of press. Um, but I'm thrilled to report that just last week, the opponents dropped the lawsuit. <laughs> Woo! And a huge shout out to some of the people in this room that stuck by us when the going was very, very tough. And so I'm going to just shout a few of you out, and you're just going to raise your hands. John Orcott, Ryan Russo, Josh Benson, Clarence Eckerson, Ben Freed, the Transportation Alternatives Community, Seth Salomano, Lori Ardito, and I have to give thanks to Polly Tronberg who tried to settle along the way. A big round of applause. There was a lot of 
blood, sweat, and tears and testimony that went along with that. And it is proof that you can fight it, you can sue over it, you can lie about it, but you can't keep a good bike lane down. But even the best ideas won't get past city limits without a strong knowledge network. And that's what I think makes NACDO's model of codifying best practices into national guidance so powerful. And you can see the effect right here. In just five years since the guide was launched, um, you can see the incredible increase in the number of US cities that have put in protected bike lanes. It's tripled. There are now 83 cities with protected bike lanes. And NACDO's guides establish a new design vocabulary for urban streets, for transit streets, for bike-friendly streets, and they give cities a permission slip to innovate, to meet the realities of today instead of defaulting to 1915's highway design standards. But even this tremendous input and output barely keeps pace with the amazing work that each and every one of you is doing every day. And NACDO's explosive growth demonstrates the power of these ideas and the thirst for these kinds of projects at the local level. NACDO cities and suburbs constitute one half of the US population and they account for one half of the United States GDP. So while we take stock of the cities that have brought us here, I think we should also give a shout out to some of our newest members who joined this year. So welcome to Nashville, to New Haven, West Hollywood, and San Luis Obispo. <laughs> welcome to the revolution. Welcome to the family. And this year, we're also very excited to announce that NACDO membership is now open to transit agencies. Big welcome to New York MTA, Miami-Dade County, and Portland TriMet. Huge, big sea change for us. And as we all know, the partnership between transit agencies and DOTs is critical for developing strong transit opportunities and choices on the ground. And we need to build our streets with transit in mind from the start and not as an afterthought and not as an overlay. And moving fast in the last five years wasn't by chance. It was actually by design. Because as you know, people have almost given up that we could actually make change on our streets. But the transportation construction programs typically take five years to get done. And so people just didn't think that we could get anything done. And that snail's pace of change made it hard for people to believe that their streets could actually be any different. But we have the power to change our streets now. And we can build the momentum for more. This is Times Square in 2008. 90% of the traffic was on foot, but they only had 10% of the space. And making the initial change to this space took only hours, but it actually set the stage for a much larger transformation, which is being built out now. And in less than 10 years, we've gone from business as usual predictions of Armageddon if we try to change anything, to calls from major newspapers to pedestrianize all of Broadway. And projects like these set the stage for dramatic changes in urban transportation. And you are now seeing it everywhere. Cities are at the heart of what NACDO does. And in the last five years, what you all have done has been extraordinary. Whether it's building plazas and bike share stations in Philadelphia, whether it's public space and safer crossings in Memphis, protected bike lanes in Chicago, Salt Lake City, home of the first fully protected intersection for bikes in the United States, rolling out the red carpet for transit in San Francisco with dedicated bus lanes to keep transit moving, pocket plazas in Mexico City, making it easier for pedestrians to cross safety, safely and adding vibrancy to asphalt, dedicating space for people, families, children of all ages, just able to get around by bike in Philadelphia, and repurposing car lanes in Los Angeles to meet and to linger, dedicated space for light rail in Minneapolis, and integrating green stormwater infrastructure, creating bike share systems that provide mobility for everyone, reallocating space in New York City, 
work in Toronto, in Austin. But despite our success, we still have more work to do. That's the number of people killed on US roads in 2015. One person killed every 15 minutes, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. It turns out that people are not so good at the driving thing. These deaths, injuries, and crashes are preventable and predictable. And we're not going to get to zero deaths with airbags, seat belts, and anti-lock brakes. Street design is the most important tool we have to stop traffic deaths. And the work that we do here will help turn the tide. We've made progress to improve safety inside the vehicle, but there's much more that we need to do outside the vehicle. And traffic injuries and deaths aren't just a problem in the United States. They're a leading cause of death globally. And it doesn't have to be this way. The design work we do and the results you've achieved have transformed our streets. Simple changes that are as big for people outside the lanes as they are inside the lanes. Changes that are better for everyone and better for the future of cities. Our newest blueprint for better streets is coming out next month when the Global Street Design Guide hits the bookshelves. And thanks to Sky Duncan and her team and her team. Oh, that's my phone. Is that Sky? Yeah, I did give you a shout out. Um, and I also want to give a big shout out to Kelly Larson at Bloomberg Philanthropies who made uh, this design guide possible. And it is going to be a new tool that builds on the knowledge of global cities and translates them into a universal language for change on the ground. And NACDO Designing Cities is already making a difference. We're, we're, this is uh, at us just a few months ago. And they turned a notorious intersection into a safe crossing using something as simple as chalk. And looking ahead, there are great projects on the horizon. A new guide for building bike infrastructure for all ages and abilities, thanks to Kate Fillonier. On strategies for better public transport, and big shout out for the support and the leadership of John Orcutt and David Bragdon at Transit Center. And on green infrastructure. Um, and, and our thanks to Daryl Young and the Summit Foundation for the support there. We also, I'm excited to say, have a great new leadership program that is going to launch, working with Eno, to cultivate the next generation of forward-looking DOT leaders. You know, you look around this room. You are the people that are making changes on the ground. You know the problems that we face and you know the solutions. It is an exciting moment in time, and we have no time to waste. Let's get to work. Thank you. <laughs>